Hi, I'm Sam Edith. And I'm Amy Nelson. Welcome to What's Her Story with Sam and Amy. This is a show about the world's most remarkable women, their professional and personal journey. Together, we'll hear from gold medalists, best-selling authors, and leaders of the world's most iconic brands. Listen every Thursday or join the conversation anytime on Instagram at What's Her Story Podcast. Liz Lang is the founder of Liz Lang Maternity. She's widely credited with putting fashion maternity wear on the map. She is now the creative director and CEO of the fashion brand Fig. Since 2002, Target has carried Liz Lang for Target, the retailer's sole offering in maternity apparel. She's also the star of the popular Sony podcast, The Just Enough Family. Liz, take us back. I think most people can't imagine what it was like to grow up in one of the wealthiest families in the world. When you put it that way, it sounds like I'm, I'm dying. <laughs> it sounds like I just like I've been bragging nonstop. I, I wanted to start by saying, spoiler alert, we lost the money. <laughs> so like it's not like like it's not, it's because I just can't have people think that I'm just sitting around like, yes, yes, Sam and Amy, it's incredible to be this rich. <laughs> so, but all right, but going back. Going uh, by back the way, Liz, I don't think feel- I might I would have asked the question if it was still the case. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I just it's, like, like, it's like we interviewed we interviewed um Melinda Gates, which was amazing. It was yeah, actually oh, her wow. last interview before the divorce okay. with Bill was announced. Oh, right. But it would be like us sitting down with Melinda and being like, So Melinda, what's it like to be a billionaire? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Tell okay. me this, you know me, I'm not that tacky, but I think in this no, no, no. Think... you didn't ask anything wrong. This is like <laughs> I was very open. My podcast is an open book. I want you to, I want to talk about it. I'm totally blunt. It was more that for your listeners, I just wanted to make sure that they didn't think that of me. Um Okay, so you know it was, uh, it was uh, like I think that the 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 normal the thing the expected thing to say is like oh money can't bring happiness and money is hard but you know there were things about it that that were hard Um, you know the, the 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 public aspect of it was strange and hard but there was a lot about it obviously that was really fun and really great like looking back on it I feel like I was privy to a very wild ride uh, that is unusual um, and that. I look back on kind of with, with fondness, you know, that, that like, it's a lot I got to do, a lot I saw, a lot of experience that, you know, isn't typical. Well, mm-hmm. give our listeners makes- a day in the life, you know, just example of a Saturday in your childhood. So you've listened. All right. Um, okay. So, so when I was growing up, one of my favorite things to do, and, and this was like getting into when I was a little older, like in high school, would be that um, my parents would typically, my parents were, 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 were big consumers. Um, and I, and I love that about them. And AKA I'm a big shoppers. Myself. Shoppers, shoppers. <laughs> and I am too. And I think that's what makes the economy go around. And I, I, I encourage, like, I always encourage people, especially having been a retailer myself, like, I think that people that have the money to spend should spend it because that helps other people. Actually, I mean, in addition to charity and all sorts of other stuff. But um, so um, my, I used to like to go with my parents. They would, we would, li- we we lived on, we lived very close to Madison Avenue. We lived on Seventy uh, Fifth and Fifth. So, but so we would walk down Madison Avenue. I'd walk down Madison Avenue with my parents, and we would basically stop in, you know, most stores at the time. I mean, this was, you know, the. 80s so like Armani was a big store so we would you know we would stop at Armani and everywhere we went <laughs> this all sounds so crazy now but everywhere we went you know the salespeople, of course knew my parents and so we you know treated very well whisked into back rooms like what can we show you what can we show you like bringing in merchandise um, and I think the funniest part uh, is that um, there was this jeweler named uh, the jewelry store was called Fred Layton and the owner himself is actually his name was Murray Munshine, but he had changed his name to Fred Layton, you know, because it was a more glamorous name for the jewelry store. Then, but we, uh, right, but we still called him Murray, and we would go there, and it was small. And today, people are very like people will say to me like, "Oh, I'm so intimidated even to walk in there." But to me, that was just a place where we would stop in uh, at around lunchtime. We'd go to the back, and often uh, Murray would have you know smoked salmon, bagels, like a lunch kind of a lunch. So that would often be. Lunch. <laughs> 
lunch um, at Fred Layton, which I, again, like, of course, I mean, it's not, I'm so naive that I think, oh, everyone does that, but it didn't seem unusual to me at that time at all. We were close to Murray. It made a ton of sense. Um, and um, and that was kind of the afternoon. You know, we walked around, we shopped. I mean, again, I think that my parents, if they're listening to this, because they've certainly said it to me offline, will be like, we went to museums. We were cultural. And they were. <laughs> they were. Like, like, like 100% were, are. Uh, I'm just talking about the part that I liked. If they were going to a gallery, I wasn't really all that interested in joining. But if they wanted to walk Madison Avenue and stop at Fred Layton and Armani and everywhere else, Bergdorf's, that was fun. So I would come along. So that was Saturday. Um, what do you... What do you remember about the work, about the comp their, comp their company? Like, what do you remember about that as a child? Well, I mean, again, that was a fun, I mean, I'll say a couple things. One is, and I, this is like, is that I always say, and I actually just said it to a group last night, when people are always debating, like, this is, this is, my, my, my family did nothing illegal. So that, the, there's no comparison there at all. But I always say that um, when I heard, like, people are always like, do you think Ruth Madoff knew? You know, they always say, do you think she knew? And I always say to people, like, you don't understand how easy it is. I, I have no idea if she knew or didn't know, and I don't know Ruth Madoff or the Madoffs. Don't know them. But um, I always say, well, I know what it's like to, like, spend a lot of time, like, at a business and have it be your family business and actually have no idea really what they do there. Like, I could totally <laughs> see that. Like, if someone said, well, actually, no, Reliance Group Holdings was just, like, a Ponzi scheme, I'd be like, oh, I, I didn't know. But so anyway, but I used to like, it was fun. Like I, I often, um, as I got older, especially after I graduated from college, I was working at Vogue where the offices were nearby to my family's, uh, my family business, my, you know, where my dad and my uncle, where their offices were. So I would often go there for lunch and, um, it was fun. You know, they had a, they had a private dining room and then my dad and my uncle had a private dining room within the private dining room, um, where I would sit with them and it was like, but the, I think what people are responding to about the podcast is there's a lot about it where the details are different. Like just the, like, like the way when we watch the Sopranos, like, you know, it, it's the, the details were different on um, my, I don't come from a mob family, but I was like, Oh, I get it. Like they've got this, you know, Tony has issues with his business partners, issues with his wife, his children are giving him a hard time. It's kind of like in my family, the same thing. I would sit with my dad and my uncle and what would we talk about? They usually, I was in my twenties. When are you getting married? Who are you dating? Can we introduce you to this one? You know, I mean, it was like a typical Jewish, I mean, it wasn't like we were sitting around talking about, you know, money and business and power. It was really fun. It was very comfort. It was, there was something very mooring about it. Like when I walked into those beautiful offices, I knew that, you know, it felt very, it felt, I mean, again, ironic given the ending, but it felt very protected, like that my life was very, very um, set and that things, you know, to a certain degree, a huge safety net, that things just couldn't really go wrong. There was like teams of people that were helping and there and worked for the family. I, it just, it felt something kind of fun about it. Mm -hmm. And then Jonathan Adler, who is one of your dearest friends, the designer Jonathan Adler, had said, you know, Liz Steinberg was the last person you would ever expect to have a full-time job. And basically it was like PS, let alone an empire, right? So how did, how did you end up becoming this pioneer in the fashion maternity wear category? You know, even he's right. Of course, I, I would say that I thought to myself that I was going to work like everyone else I knew. Um, and then possibly get married, hopefully. I was hoping to get married, have children. I wasn't, I mean, it, this is, so much has changed since, even since I graduated from college in 1988 to today. So, you know, again, just understand this for what the time period it was. It wasn't 100% a sure thing that I thought I was gonna work my whole life. I thought, you know, may, I, I might just raise my children and, you know, I don't know what else I would do. I hadn't really thought it out. But um, lo and behold, I ended up like so many entrepreneurs, and I didn't know, I only know this looking back, that after, you know, working at Vogue and then working with this struggling young designer, getting this idea to, st to start a line of maternity clothing that looked more like regular maternity clothing, I had that thing that happens to entrepreneurs. Like, I couldn't stop thinking about the idea of making maternity clothing. I, it, was, it was crazy. I hadn't even had children yet myself, although I was newly married and you know, getting pregnant was mm -hmm. on my mind, but I felt like I was up at night thinking about it. I, I, I was obsessed with it. And I felt that if I didn't start this, I, I, 
like I wouldn't be able to forgive myself if somebody else did for some reason. So even then, though, even then, I started it without a business plan, without an idea that this is, I mean, maybe I'm saying too much, but today everyone's an entrepreneur. I mean, we're all entrepreneurs, right? Everybody sees white space. Everyone's disrupting something. Everyone's <laughs> everyone's everything. I mean, again, I don't want to offend either of you, but everyone's women power and what's it like to be a woman and it's right. so hard. Right. None of this crossed my mind. It wasn't, well, I'm a woman, so I can't do this. It wasn't that I saw white space. No, I had this little idea. I thought I would do it for a little while, see what happened. I didn't expect big things to happen. Lo and behold, it took off beyond my wildest expectations. And it's not crazy. I mean, as funny as it is, I mean, obviously I started to do something that was resonating, that was bringing me an enormous amount of, um, I don't know, satisfaction. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was all of a sudden, like I had started something that was big. Um, and, um, and I loved it. And I've been a sort of, and I became obsessed and I've worked around the clock and I've never really stopped loving that. Like it just bit me. You mentioned, you know, the time, right? That, that you were starting your business, you were young, you were newly married. It was a time when not all women worked and not all women were starting businesses and maybe it wasn't something you expected. What did your husband at the time think of it as it took he off? Was, he was great about it. He was completely, completely supportive. Um, he was, you know, surprised, proud. I think everybody was surprised, including myself. I mean, it, I didn't think I had the next big idea. Like, t that's another part about today's entrepreneurs. Everyone thinks they've got the next big idea, and some of them do, and that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But that would never have crossed my mind. Um, I just thought it was something I wanted to do. Um, I think, you know, he was, he was, he was, he was very supportive. Like it was, it was what no, was the first? What was the first step you took to start the business? Because I think even a lot of our listeners would say, "Well, okay, that's great that you just decided to start it, but what does that mean? You rented space, or what was the first move?" All right. Well, it took a year to start from the time I thought thought of the idea to start it, partially because I was so paralyzed with fear about starting it, um, and also again different times. So today, I think the first step is you write up a business plan, you go out and raise millions of dollars. No, um, I. I told my father that I wanted to do this, and he said, um, I will help you a little bit at the beginning, but it has to rate, make money pretty, because also my dad was a businessman, so he was like, so it has to make money pretty quickly, because if it doesn't make money quickly, um, it's just a hobby, and I'm not funding your hobby. So it, I had no delusions that I was just going to be like, money was going to be thrown at me, so I just want your listeners to know, despite my background, like there was, an, I wasn't doing this with like the backing of my family. Right. I was doing it with, at the end, I think I've said this, I think my dad in the end did ultimately give me about, over time, paying different bills, $25,000, which wasn't wow, nothing at all. And nothing. much more than many have, but kind of nothing. Yeah. So yeah. the first thing I did was I pounded the pavement, no internet, found a factory, you know, there was no internet back there, found a factory that was willing to make sort of one-off samples for me. I mean, this is pretty granular, you know, again, uh, so I didn't, so I didn't have to invest in a lot of inventory, uh, found a mill in Italy. I knew some of this from working with a young designer that I've been working with prior. So I knew mm -hmm. how to find factories and I knew how to find, um, fabric mills. Again, the okay. world has changed. So I, I, I contacted this fabric mill. I ordered some fabric. I sent it to this factory. I I noticed that across the street from me, I lived on 61st street, um, between park and Madison in a little small one bedroom apartment. And across the street from me was a tiny building and it had a for sale, like a for rent sign. And I found an office in there, did not face the street, had nothing to do with normal retail, little office in the back on like the third floor. Um, I rented that space. It was extraordinarily inexpensive. Right now, I can't think of the rent, but it could have been like fifteen hundred dollars a month. I mean, I'm you know small space. I bought a little rack. I had some samples made, like one of each of my designs, and I thought that I would just start at a telephone, at a fax machine, and I thought I'll start seeing customers by appointment only. And the only way I could find customers was my friends who happened to be pregnant. But I had this theory having been recently married and I knew what that was like where you're like networking like crazy. You're asking everybody everything like, oh, who was your band? Who did your flowers? You're reading. You're just hyper-focused. Again, things may have changed since then, but this is the way it felt in 1997. So I, um, I thought women would be great networkers and I thought my friends would tell other friends. What started to happen was um, like some, I got some press. I did not have a PR agency, but I started to get some press and then I started to get celebrities and then things just started to snowball in a way that was very, it, it was almost inexplicable, but I mean, you know, I could take you through it, but it was, it was unusual. So I think it's, it's really, I love the question about like how 
what you, the tangible steps you first took to start a business. I have another question that kind of follows on to this. So you built this juggernaut, which was, I'm sure, 24 hours a day for years. Right, During the years you're building this, a lot of really hard things happened to you. Yes. You know, you, you had cancer, your family, business and bankrupt, you got divorced, right? Like, yeah. how did you find a way to keep running and growing this business while these things were happening? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that I'm, I think, again, it's all in hindsight. I think part of this, of my personality that made me a good entrepreneur also made me able to handle all these things. And, and I, what I mean by that is, and I, maybe it's almost like, it's almost possibly too much, but I'm bizarrely optimistic, which I think you kind of need to be to be an, op, to be an entrepreneur. So I'm bizarrely optimistic. Like I always think everything will work out. It's very, very hard to bring me down, almost impossible. Um, and, um, so, and I'm, I'm able to compartmentalize, like to a, mm -hmm. to a really bizarre degree. So I just decided everything that was going on in my life, no matter what it was, like, let's take the cancer. Like when I had cancer, I had to do, I was in the hospital for two weeks for a, like a radical hysterectomy. I went through chemotherapy and radiation at the same time. I was exhausted. I'm not complaining. I'm saying that's what it was like. I had two young yeah. children under the age of three, but I didn't want, I, I made this decision that I wasn't really going to tell anyone. And I wasn't going to tell my employees. I told like one senior person because I, I needed them to know. But because I felt like if I didn't sort of tell anyone, and I was lucky, obviously, I didn't have the kind of cancer that was, I mean, I was terrified, but it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be a death sentence. Anything could go wrong, but it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, I didn't lose my hair. So I, so not losing your hair, what makes it easier to um, sort of not you know, to not mm -hmm. tell people. I realize that's not an option for many. So I, I, I semi worked through it. I didn't tell people. I felt that it kept me going to not have to be talking about it to my friends and at the office that I had something. I felt, I felt, that's the weird part of me. I felt kind of lucky that I had this major distraction in my business. Like the business couldn't stop. Like one of the mm -hmm. things I talk about is that at the same time that I had cancer, I was, I was, I was sort of trying to talk to Target about signing a licensing deal. But of course I didn't want Target to know that I had cancer because I I thought, you know, it was very exaggerated in my mind as well. Like that was part right. of what was awful about it. But I thought, well, if they knew that, they would never want to do a deal with me. That everyone's going to think I'm dying. And I well, I, and to I be can't. fair, the company had your name on it, so it was so yeah. intertwined with you personally. Yes, it would. It would have been. I don't. It wouldn't have been good for the yeah. brand for people to think that. It, I was probably right. Exactly. But I remember that. I so I kept putting off. I had to go to. I had to go to Minneapolis in order to talk face to face with Target about the idea for this licensing deal, and but I couldn't go because I had to have radiation every day. So I literally couldn't leave New York City. But I couldn't tell them that. So I just remember that I kept putting it off. I kept putting it off, and then finally I had like a two day break in the radiation. For some reason, they were changing the protocol, and I went overnight. And it was, it was hard. I mean, I was always exhausted because of it. I was always exhausted. And the same thing was I was launching my new license line for Nike. And they gave this really big party that I still look back on. Like, I wish I could have appreciated it more. I wish that I had been healthier at that moment. But they took over Michael's Restaurant, which was a big restaurant in New York back then. And they invited, like, a total who's who and made this huge deal about it. But I was so exhausted on the day of that party that I remember I was like, you know, I could bear, I could, I had to sit down in my shower in order to wash my hair. Like it was really like gritting my teeth and getting through it. But it was, it was the fact that I had all these things going on positively, like the business that yeah. I think really got me through everything else that you asked me about, um, if that makes sense. And it then does. when, when, yeah. when your family, I, I guess it was only four years after you started Liz Lang Maternity that your family business fell apart. Or your, you know, yes. your, your birth family's business fell apart. Yes. Yeah. How did that manifest itself in your life? Well, that was really, I mean, obviously it was extremely stressful. Like people always, again, like whenever someone's an entrepreneur, people use words like bravery. Like it was so brave of you to like leave your job and start this <laughs> business. And I was like, it wasn't. First of all, I was, you know, 29 years old. So I didn't know about bravery. You know, you're just not, you know, you're, you're not that scared. I wasn't going to starve if the business didn't work out. I had my my, my family was very rich. My husband was somewhat, it was, I, you know, was success. We were young, but you know, he was starting out and was somewhat successful. I, I wasn't risking a lot. All of a sudden my family loses its money. And like our life depends on my business. Like that had never been part of the deal. I mean, I was treating it that way already, thankfully. Like I wasn't, I wasn't in it halfway for you. I mean, by that point I already had the target deal and the Nike deal and my Liz Lang stores. So no, but 
it became like, I don't, I don't know that I would have sold the business. I sold the business in 2007. Um, I don't know that I would have other than I felt a responsibility to monetize the success of Liz Lane maternity for my family, for my, my, mm -hmm. my new family, not for my parents. Um, and I don't think I would have, I would have been able to, and that, that's something that I am sad about. I mean, I'm, I'm over it today, but you know, it was being Liz Lang of Liz Lang maternity was very much a part of my identity. It was, it was, it was everything. And that was hard. And I definitely, that was one thing that I definitely wouldn't have happened. I, um, I knew you back then. And I remember it being very difficult for you to sort of overnight go from having this identity to suddenly having sold it and thinking what's next. What it was. got you to what's next? Well, I was 40 years old, which is young, now looking back, quite young. Um, but I, I didn't, I didn't, I knew that I wasn't like retiring. Uh, and it kind of just fell into place. Um, I was lucky in that I, I knew this woman named Mindy Grossman. I knew Mindy because she had run women. We've had her on the her. show. Oh, wow. So, you know, we Mindy. both She's love great. Mindy. Yeah. Mindy's She's the wonderful. Best. She's the best. But I knew Mindy in a very different role. I knew Mindy when she ran women's apparel for Nike back in 19, like 99. And she was the one that had approached me and asked me if I would do a Liz Lang for swoosh maternity athletic apparel line. I, I, at that point, just like, I mean, you guys, I had no idea who I mean, Mindy wasn't Mindy yet really. And, um, um, and I mean, she had a job at Nike and lived in, um, Beaver, Beaverton. Yeah, Beaverton. Mm -hmm. So, um, I met her that through that deal. We ended up doing that deal. I got to know her. And when I sold Liz Lang maternity and I really couldn't do maternity clothing anymore, like that part was, I had sold the rights to do that. Mindy offered me, um, to come on. She had just taken over at HSN. I mean, I could have the timing wrong, but somewhat like that at home shopping network. Yep. And she said, why don't you come on? And my friend, Stephanie Greenfield, who had owned scoop, she was doing a show. So why don't you do, uh, a show, you know, uh, do a line of clothing, not maternity, but you know, at a target price point um, mm -hmm. for our audience. And I ended up doing that for 10 years. And so, and that became a successful line um, for Home Shopping Network. And I would sell it on air once a month. So it's my life started to like kind of piece together um, from a career point of view. Um, I mean, Liz Lang, I think Liz Lang will always, starting Liz Lang maternity, no matter what I do, even to this day, will always be, you know, sort of the highlight for me of my career, just personally, even if something else makes more money, it just, just the, the satisfaction in that. And, and the way that I feel like that, again, I don't want to brag. There's so much, so much that I failed at, but I feel like the, the impact that had to this day on the way that women dress when they're pregnant, but you know, no matter what they're wearing is, is very gratifying to me. It's like, I, you know, it's hard for me to replicate that. So. But that's sort of how it happened. And then from, from HSN, and then when Mindy left HSN and they were merging with QVC, I really didn't want to be doing that anymore. It had been 10 years. It's exhausting. I loved it, but it's exhausting. And then I started investing in brands because I knew I, I, I couldn't quite, I mean, again, I think it's about just, for me always, it's just about trying different things and seeing what feels right. So I started investing in brands thinking, I want to be close to entrepreneurs. I know I like that. I know I found a passion for that. And I did like it. I, I, I still do it. I like investing in brands, but it didn't quite feel like enough. It's still, they weren't my brand. And I was just, right. you know, so on, some annoying person that was like, you know, possibly giving advice that perhaps they, an entrepreneur doesn't even want. Like, I mean, I get it. I've been there. So, um, so I know, you know, so I know what that's like. And so then, I mean, cut fast forward to today during COVID, um, which was crazy, uh, in like the fall of 2020, I got word that a brand that I was a huge fan of, like no, no connection to other than I wore the brand a lot, was a huge fan, this women's uh, clothing line called Fig that I had been following since its inception. Again, not as an investor, not as anything. Just I heard that Stephanie von Watzdorf, who was the founder, a woman I knew tangentially, um, was kind of just done, was ready to just kind of like, you know, let it go. And so I was like, I think I, it felt almost like meant to be. I was like, I'm looking to do something. I don't want to start something again. I know what that takes. I'm too old. Um, I wanted sort of an in-place team, a brand that had already done some of the hard work of becoming a brand, but that I could grow from there. And mm -hmm. uh, lo and behold, Fig. And, and it ended up going to auction. I ended up acquiring it and relaunching it. And it's been a year. Um, and we're still, you know, we're still, not, I mean, we're in sort of the launching phase, but it's been fabulous. And that, that's what I'm doing today. I just bought my first fig product. Oh, you did? Thank yeah, you. I bought a sweater. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Interesting. They're really beautiful. <laughs> Thank um, you. Thank you, guys. 
So tell us about what was going on personally. I know you had a very complicated marriage and all yeah. of the things that have unfolded since. Will you share with us a little bit about the roller coaster that was your personal life? Yeah, sure. So I'm not sure which part. So I, you know, I, I had this kind of crazy situation where I, I married somebody that was absolutely unbelievable on paper and probably to a certain degree in real life as well. He was, and I'm not, I'm not just saying this, like he, like you could, you could look at this picture. He was very, very handsome, you know, across between, let's say, I know he looked a lot like Harry Hamlin. Uh, he looked a bit like, um, uh, uh, well, whatever, it doesn't matter. He was very handsome. He was very, <laughs> very smart. He had gone to Yale and Yale Law School. I mean, he got to Stanford and Yale Law School. He was very, 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 very smart and very funny and very, you know, all good things. And, um, but uh, during the course of our marriage, um, I think, you know, it's hard even to explain, but I think for him, <clears throat> all his early success, which was, you know, off the charts, wasn't happening for him as quickly in his career as he would have expected. And I think he started to suffer from now looking back on it you know, bordering on a mental breakdown. But I was very busy trying to run my business. These two young children, um, you know, my family was in there. There was a lot going on. It started to become extremely complicated between us. You know, he was very increasingly shut down, never wanted to do anything, never wanted to go anywhere, barely left the bedroom. And I felt like this huge pressure at that time to like keep up this facade of, you know, uh, I am Liz Lang from Liz Lang Maternity. I have this perfect family. I mean, for whatever reason, I mean, maybe as women we do this, but it just felt very important to me um, that things look okay on the outside. And uh, that was, you know, exhausting would be one word for it. It was, it was, <laughs> it, was it was, it was, it was very hard. Um, and um, ultimately, if it's, I think this is what you're asking, right? So ultimately I just felt, you know, I, I, ultimately I left him. That was hard too. I took the children and I moved out, which is, was, a strange and hard thing to do um and um but you know we divorced i remarried somebody that you know was fabulous and we have a very nice you know today a very nice life and he's really a father uh, to my children i mean sadly my ex-husband ended up dying post our post our divorce i'm not a i'm not a widow but um complicated would be an understatement you know, I try, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, and nothing's off the table. And I, as you know, I talked about it on the podcast, but I try not to like get into like tons and tons of details for the sake of my children. Of course. So that's why I'm, I don't mean to like gloss over it, but I'm not, it's not, it's like the one topic where I just try to like, but, but it was, it was, it was hard. And he clearly um, suffered from, you know, with so, as so many do from mental health issues that were unclear to me until mm -hmm. I was a little, I was pretty far in, you know, with two children and it was hard. Then. How old were your kids when you left? Nine and 11. And um, where did so you go when, when you left? You know, it was like, again, almost like my business. Like I, I, I again, it was, it was 2009. I think I like, you know, might have looked in the paper. I found this like rental. We were living on, at the time we had sold our apartment. It was part of another one of his like, strange crazy things that he made us sell our our beautiful family apartment not for money reasons like honestly like we like there was no there was no reason to do it he just decided that we had to and so we sold it and we were living on 71st and 3rd and i discovered this rental on 72nd street kind of nearby uh, it was too small. Like my children, I mean, my children were born, but I'm not saying this is sad for them, but they basically like slept on a pullout bed in the like living room and there was a bedroom and, um, and it was a crazy time. And I think they were confused and I was confused, but it was like, this thing took over me where I knew, I knew that if I didn't get out, if I didn't get out, even if it wasn't for me, that it was for them, mm -hmm. like that they couldn't, even though they might've thought, oh, they wanted their parents to stay together. And I get that, that they weren't seeing the right example of like, right of a family and a parents and of a father just was, I, it was just wrong. And, um, and it was hard, but I was lucky in that again, I'm from New York city. My, I have such a huge support system. So I don't mean to sound like it wasn't like I was all alone. I mean, you right. know, my parents, my cousins, my, my sister, who I'm so close to as Sam knows a lot of close, close, close friends. It wasn't, I mean, it was hard, but it wasn't, um, I mean, there are a lot of women who do a lot of things that are just a lot harder. How did you meet your husband? That's a funny story. So I call it a double blind date. And I always say to women, even in today's world, and I guess today's world doesn't, well, it sort of applies. I always say that you have to say yes to all dates 
all things and even after the first date even if you think you don't like him unless he seems like a serial killer you have to go on a second date I always say the same thing I'm always like unless he has three heads you go on that second date because yes. someone's very different on the second date than they are on the first date exactly and I feel like women the people just these young kids are just so picky about everything it's like you don't yep. know yeah. you don't know and you're looking so, for the wrong things right a hundred percent so and that is that is the story here so uh, my cousin um, and, and my husband, who's a lawyer and one of his clients close, like, sort of close friend client had dinner. And so neither of them knew both of us. They each only knew one of us. That's what makes it double blind, which was kind of, you know, so my cousin said, I'm looking for somebody for my cousin. His client said, Oh, I'm looking for someone for my lawyer. Anyway, we ended up going, <laughs> we ended up going on a blind date. I am not like not even remotely interested. I mean, if he were here, he would say not remotely. He said afterwards <laughs> that his client said, how did it go? And he said, well, she's no romantic interest in me, but I definitely have her business. And that is correct. My husband is a, is a lawyer who doesn't like me talking about it, but a very, very top law firm. And I was going through some events with Lasagna Maternity and business. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is incredible. I'm going to have all this like great legal advice that I couldn't possibly <laughs> afford. And I was thinking like, he's going to be a really good friend to have. I have no, too bad that I have zero interest in him. But I continued, he continued to ask me out. We would go to these like, on these very nice dates. He was so nice. He would like, he was so helpful. <laughs> and I was not interested. Cut to my, I'm on a family vacation with my children and my sister and her kids. And my sister always says this, that like she looked over at me. We were actually, in, we were touring around Israel. So we were in like one of those, our little van. And she said, every time she looked over, I was on my phone, like smiling, laughing, like <laughs> texting. Smiling. And she would say like, what are you doing? Like, who are you texting with? And I was like, oh, you know, this, this guy, this, you know, this, my, my lawyer. <laughs> and she was like, oh, I don't think he's your lawyer. Like you like him. And I was like, oh, I don't like him. Anyway, like, you know, one thing led to another and I realized that, that I, in fact, I did. But it was every, not, again, in terms of romantic advice, I had thought to myself, I want somebody um, who's either going through a divorce or his wife has, has died. Sadly, I wasn't looking for anyone to be dead, but I wanted somebody who understood <laughs> what it was like to have children and not a lot of free time. And so I didn't want, my husband had never been married. He didn't have children. I was like, this is not what I'm looking for. Um, he, you know, he's two years younger than me. I was like, I need to be with somebody older, like the whole mm -hmm. thing. Like, so I, you know, you have these checklists in your mind and they're just all wrong. So it's just but kind he of is still. Fun. I mean, I I've had the pleasure of, you know of getting to know you him know. a little bit, and he is so kind, charming, really brilliant, and stable and confident. And I think that probably after you, what you went through, you didn't add like stable and confident. We're probably really high up there. <laughs> But I didn't even know that. They should have been. But I would have been like, you know, like so many of us, I think I was looking for like hard to get, you know, the dangerous. Yes. Like who knows what I was. I mean, I don't think I actually articulated those things to myself. But I wasn't used to somebody who was just really great, steady, just kept like just, you know, just normal. Um, and so, um, but yes, it turned out to be the best thing ever. And because he didn't have children, my children are his children. So, I mean, on every level, it's it's been you know, good, but I, it how just, do your it was kids, a funny. How do your kids look at your career? They make a lot of fun of it, but then I privately think that they are proud of me, but they would never admit that. I mean, like, um, you know, they, they're constantly, you know, I, 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 you know, just teasing me. They don't, they, they, they can't believe it. If uh, the few times when we go somewhere and someone says, Oh, I wore your maternity clothing or their friends, mothers say things to them. They are in a state of shock. Like, she did. She knows who you are. That kind of thing. But I, you know, I mean, the wind beneath my wings. <laughs> but, um, but, they, um, but they, I think, I, I mean, I, I hope it's good. I mean, I'd say like, you know, the other part of it, and Sam, you probably heard me talk about this, is that I always say, and this is true too, that, um, you know, until I sold the business, I probably didn't, I mean, I, no regrets, nothing you can do about it. You make the choices you make. But I think there's a lot these days of like women can have it all. Women could do it all. Anybody can do everything. And it, in my experience, that's simply not true. Like we have a finite mm -hmm. amount of energy. We have a finite amount of time. And I think that, and my children are, they're proud of me. They're thrilled about it. But they would be the first to say that like, you know, during their earliest years, I probably wasn't, you know, there are a lot of things that I, I mean, it, it's sad, but there just, there are a lot of things that I missed. Like, you know, there are definitely things that I missed. Would you go back and change that if you could? 
I wouldn't change the growth of Liz Lang, so I don't know if it's possible, but I do mm-hmm. wish because like now, and are you, I don't think you toured there yet, but now that they, you know, are now that they're 21 and 23 and really they don't, they're not dying to spend all their time with me. I mean, we are close, but you know, they really, they've got lives. They got boyfriends, girlfriends, friends. I, I, I look back and I kind of want to shake myself over the times when all they wanted was for me to be around. And I was, you know, they still, they joke. And again, it's all a joke, but they're like, oh, we always knew when you were in the audience of the school play because the light of your Blackberry was shining on your face. <laughs> and that is true. Do you remember the black, I was attached to my Blackberry. I was always in my mind somewhere. But I mean, at the, truthfully at the office too, I was mentally like, is this happening today at home? Like it was just, it was, yeah. a, it was a lot of juggling. Well, and, and ironically, I, was, I mean, and I'm sure they can appreciate this. Your family got into unexpected financial trouble. And if you hadn't been devoted to building Liz Lang, you sure. might not have survived that in a healthy way. Right. So it's like you actually unbeknownst to anyone at the time were basically the pillar of financial stability in your family you know what i've never thought about it that way and that's true i might even point that out to them that's yeah. very very uh that 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 that's true like it was it, it was real it wasn't just for my ego like it was actually real like it was a real business that i needed and and the the sale of it was was a very big you know financial event for us so um you're right and uh but definitely you know definitely those first you know their, their earlier years, I was very um, focused on both. I mean, I had C-sections, but I jumped out of bed after day two and wouldn't let them let me stay in the hospital. I had yeah. to get back to my work. Um, so, um, but yeah. I asked, like, if you would change anything. Not, not because, wait, I'm so sorry about my dogs. I'm so sorry. No, you're fine. Not because, okay, like, go, I think that, on. not because I think that anybody should, but, like, yeah, I'm sure, you know, Sam and I are both entrepreneurs too. My kids are between seven and two and I missed, I missed a lot. The pandemic obviously changed things because it made right. me be home and work from home. But the thing is like, I, I, I don't mean to sound cruel when I say it, but I wouldn't change it. Like I've I have built a, a business that is going to change their lives and help them. And, and like, there are lots of other people who love them and I'm there when it matters. And like, it's okay to not want to change it. Right. I think I, I feel love like that you said that, that, Amy. Yeah, that's I have to be. I guess then yes. If I'm totally honest, yes. Like, and I, but but I didn't know if you two feel this way. I guess to be. I guess if I'm going to be totally totally honest, there's so much talk also about like um, um, this idea of like women. And it's not that I, I'm not against it. I'm not against it. But this the flexible work. The sometimes you work, sometimes you don't work. Blah blah blah. The problem is that doesn't actually work. Like like mm-hmm. it's 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 more intense than that. I mean sometimes that like you can't build a major business part time. Um, and it's, and if you want to be part-time and I applaud that and you want to spend more time with your children and stuff, you should do that. But like there Mm -hmm. are, there are trade-offs. Like it's like, like the trade-off of building the big business is you, you miss some things with your kids. Well, and most people, by the way, um, most people in America cannot afford to not work full-time. Right. I mean, that's the other thing. Let's be clear. Like that is is not an option for most people. Right. I just feel like it's a very fashionable thing that I, I, I hear in a lot of women's conferences and a lot of it just it's a very fashionable thing. I always feel like I should be saying it. I should be saying like, yes, 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 yes. It's all about like, frankly, like, no, if I hear an employee of mine, you know, wants to go part time, it's not great news. I mean, I, I say yes, because like, what am I going to do? <laughs> but like, 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 I mean, it's fine. Um, but oh. it, it, there's a level of commitment, especially if you want to yeah. be an entrepreneur. That Absolutely. isn't even, it's not even 12 hours. It's 24 hours. No. Well, yeah, I mean, right. I, even, but even when, even when you're an employee, like when I had my first daughter, I was a litigator still. And I had this okay. idea that like, I couldn't be a full-time litigator. And certainly it was really, really hard to be a full-time litigator right. because it's so unpredictable. Right. Um, as you know, being married to a lawyer, whatever type of law he practices, like it's a, it's a shit show. It's a mess of a profession. Yeah. Like it's, it's client services, but I went to 80% because I was like, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm just going to pull myself out a little bit. So it'll be okay. You cannot be an 80% litigator. I just like took a pay cut right. and to my firm's credit, my firm Dorsey and Whitney to their credit. When I went and told them like, this isn't working. I just took a pay cut. It's my fault. They're like, we're going to make it right. And they paid me the back pay for all the time I was 80% because they're like, you are working full time. Cause you end up, cause it's just right. I yeah. think it's, it's a, it's a personal, it's, it's a personality it's a work type. Ethic it's thing the, also, it's right. Thing. It's like you're right. Right. 
like you just you can't it's impossible like what do you tell yourself how do you get yourself to 80 percent? as you said like i don't even know what that means um yeah i don't yeah like what did that mean i don't even right right I, I, in my mind, I was like i'm not gonna work on wednesdays i right. always worked on wednesdays like you couldn't <laughs> tell people like i don't lawyer on wednesdays if right. you and have a your, hearing and that your client calls it's sorry it's wednesday <laughs> like what like right Exa exactly exactly yeah it's, I, I mean it's really it's hard right so it's so I'm, no judgments i'm just saying it's hard Talk yeah, to us about gray gardens because you've always been <laughs> not just fashionable yourself, but super interested in the history of fashion and society. And it seems like gray gardens was like the perfect marriage of your, your private passions. That's funny. Yes. I mean, I love, um, I do. I mean, I, I, I like fashion a lot. Obviously I think that Jackie and her sister Lee were two of the most fashionable women, you know, in the history of, that's Jackie O for women. people who are not familiar. Yeah. I'm sorry, Jackie O and Lee Radzewell. Um, and um, but really, the thing with Great Gardens, which it has an incredible history, but the cool part for me and what really attracted me to it was I grew up, you know, under the circumstances that we discussed. And so I, we, my parents had a house basically around the corner from from Great Gardens when I was growing up. We had this state-of-the-art modern house that my parents closest friends was this very 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 well known at the time modern architect named Charles Guathme he built the house it was glass and modern but all my friends all around East Hampton when I was growing up the houses were these old shingle style kind of rambling they called them cottages but that was you know not really um and um and I really love them I think they're beautiful. They remind me of old East Hampton. And most of them today have been torn down. They've been replaced by, you know, McMansions and, uh, you know, Erzatz versions of old, of old Hampton's cottages. But I really like the real thing. So when Great Gardens came for sale, it wasn't just that it was Great Gardens. I mean, that's the icing on the cake. That is so cool. I love it. But honestly, it wasn't that I ever thought I was going to live in a home that Jackie Kennedy or Lee Radzewell family lived in. I... That's nice, but I wasn't like obsessed with that. It was really that I was obsessed with the idea that there was this house that was still in this that was that still maintained all its old charm. That was still this beautiful old typical Hampton style house, and I I love the house. Um, mm -hmm. and so it was really that honestly, like it was. Um, there, there just aren't a lot of them, but because it was Grey Gardens, the owners prior to us were also very well known. Um, uh, ben Bradley, who's no longer alive, but the you know the, the editor in chief for the Washington Post, who broke Watergate, and his wife, the the journalist and society columnist, very well known as well, Sally Quinn. Um, they own the house, and they had restored the house when they bought it instead of tearing it down because you wouldn't tear down Grey Gardens. So they they restored it, and then um, we were able to buy it from them. Um, and um, you know, I felt lucky and it's very fun to be there and it's crazy how many people are actually absolutely obsessed with that house i'm not one of them but it surprised me that it surprises me the amount of cars that stop to stare over you know our fence at that house all day long all night long i, I found people in our gardens like they jump the fence like they're they're obsessed they're like five facebook oh groups gosh. devoted just to gray gardens all right it's funny they'll say really mean things like well liz lang has terrible taste so you can see what she did it's hideous like it's it's actually hilarious but anyway so that's the house <laughs> do your kids um do they share your optimism your because you almost have a Pollyanna-ish view on the way to the school bus this morning my daughter was worried about being late and she's like you're so calm and I'm like things tend to work out and she was like boy you and I have different lives I'm like no we don't we have different <laughs> mindsets <laughs> different we have perspectives different mindsets. <laughs> right um I don't think I don't think I don't think I like I think my kids are more like yours in fact I think I don't know if yours feel this way I think it almost frustrates them like they think they they mistake it for sweeping things under the rug where I'm but it's not that it's not that I'm unwilling to go into the deeper issues I'm very willing it's that it's that you know but my first reaction is kind of you're okay do you know what I mean like because I genuinely mean it but I feel like they they so yes I think they think it's almost like a a strange superficiality or something yeah but that's like you like and I, that's why you've been successful at being an entrepreneur it's just kind of it's kind of who we are um, I think it's like a strange superpower actually because like is. well if you think about it like if you think about entrepreneurship right like the vast 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 majority of businesses are gonna fail right. you know that if you're still willing to start one like you gotta right. believe 
Right. You almost have like, it's almost like a flaw that's a positive, but it's almost like you can't understand odds. Like you just said, <laughs> right, like, 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 right. It's like, why would we be doing this? It doesn't make sense. We're not going sense. to Vegas together. Uh, <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. It's going to land um, on red. Just, it's going to be an odd number. <laughs> To. Right. It's all going to work out for me. Right. No, I always say that I have Prozac running through my brain, my veins, like not blood. Like I don't know what it would take to get me really, really upset. Like I'm even like it, when you're in business, like every day people come to me with problems. I mean, my employees like this didn't happen. That didn't happen. This needs to happen. I'd always be like, oh, that's okay. So what's the solution? No problem. What's the solution? And that's just the way I kind of look at life. I hope my kids that's do because I actually think it's helpful. Um, that's awesome. Before we go to our speed round, I have one last question for you, Aim. Do you have any further questions or can I ask the last one? Okay. So you once gave me this fashion advice that I lived with for years. And it was like, okay, you just have to have your kind of style. So you always wear a dress, no, no pantyhose, a dress and high heels, and you're done. Like super easy. You don't have to match pants and a top. It's like you're just finding one color dress, a shift dress, heels and done. And so that became my style for work for so long. Then, you know, COVID hit, the world has changed. Everyone's wearing sneakers everywhere. What is Liz Lang dressing like today? And can you give me the advice on how I should be dressing today in an efficient yet fashionable way? Okay. So some of it depends on where you live, but yes. So I basically switched from, it's so funny because you described my old style. I switched from heels and a little shift dress. I almost never wear that. The reason I not, it's, this is not a shameless plug. It's just the truth. The reason that I bought fig was because I was living in Palm beach during the, the pandemic. And it struck me while I was down here that as comfortable as my sweatsuits had been in East Hampton the year prior that I could just throw on a caftan every morning. People would say, stop me on the street and say, and a pair of slides or a pair of flip flops, but with my caftan. And people would say to me, you look fabulous. Oh my gosh, like what did you do? And I'm like, oh no, I did nothing. I'm basically in my nightgown. That's how comfortable I am. <laughs> so, so to me right now, I've replaced the shift dress with a caftan. I mean, maybe I've just entered my caftan years. I mean, I am 55, but I wear a caftan almost every single day. I'm not wearing one on this podcast because I feel like it's very unflattering to be in something like really billowy when you're on a screen. But um, I basically wear caftan and when I'm not wearing a caftan um I'm kind of wearing an upscale if I'm somewhere cold I'm probably wearing an upscale version a polished not upscale a polished version of a sweatsuit like a matching set that I like like um maybe it's um you know maybe it's made of velour maybe it's made of cashmere but like a, a matching set and and flats I don't really wear heels anymore so wow. but I those are my two uniforms I wish you'd sent me that memo because I've been confused ever since. <laughs> <laughs> I should have told you that I switched. I, know. I switched during COVID. We all had to pivot. I know. And now I can't. I literally have a closet full of caftans. It's all I wear. I, even when I go out, like, even if I have to go to something dressy, I just put on, like, but By jewelry. the way, you are very naturally slender and tall. So, like, you're never going to look, like, shapeless in a caftan. Can most women pull off a caftan? Yeah, they just need to, like... Uh, depends on the length. They could belt it. I have a lot of rope belts that I've belt with mine. There's yes, definitely, okay. definitely. I think everyone can. I don't feel so thin. In fact, I think a caftan hides a million sins. Not that not not that not the weight is sins. I you know it's just a figure of speech. Um, so yes, I okay. doubt. Right. Me, it's all, I doubt I get, it's all about a caftan. Yeah, let's do the speed round. Okay. Okay. What book are you reading? Oh my God, I can't remember the name of the book. Um, oh, I just read Who is Ma Dixon? I loved it. Who is Ma Dixon? Oh. It's a, it's a mystery that twists. It's fiction, it's a mystery, and it's it's a page turner that's also very well written. Who is Ma Dixon? I can't recommend it strongly okay. enough. Okay, I'm going to read Great. that next. Um, what is your morning routine? I get up very early, around 6 a.m. I have two cups of coffee, and then because I'm in Palm Beach, I throw on, these, I throw on my headphones, and I walk I walk, the, I live on the lake trail and I walk that trail back and forth. It's like about, I do about a five mile walk. I make a lot of my morning phone calls while I'm on that walk. I listen to music. I relax. Um, sometimes listen to podcasts, just news of the day. Um, and that's kind of my morning. That, and then, then I get home and it's about 10 a.m. or sometimes it's 930 and I'm ready to kind of shower and start my day. Is that? Mm, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Who leaves you starstruck? Oh no, I'm not, I don't, I don't get stars. I've got to be honest. I don't get starstruck because I dealt with so many celebrities when I, when I was dressing them for, and 
and it's and it's I would I'll just say this many of them are lovely most of them are but don't meet your heroes um that's my advice um, so so I don't I don't I I've had too many uh, up close and personal encounters not because uh, yeah I'll leave it at that I don't, what's I'll your think favorite can... thing about yourself I think it is my optimism. I think that helps a lot. That's my favorite thing. And I have a lot of energy. Like I'm just very, I'm just naturally very, very high energy, which I like. I don't get tired easily. So Lou Burns has been listening to our entire conversation and he comes in at the end of each episode with the male perspective and usually a doozy of a question, not to, not, oh. not to put you under pressure, Lou. <laughs> Hi Liz. Hi, Liz. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Uh, I'm doing okay. Sorry if uh, if you hear some other background noise. I'm in a place where I can't find a quiet place. But um, there was a time where you were talking about your husband, and you completely lit up, and it was so amazing that it made me smile. And I was trying to find out what what can I ask you, and I wanted to ask you about him, but I don't want to get too much into him. But there is something I do want to know. Is there something else in your life, like an activity or a person or a place that you um, that you want to do or that you do that brings you that same type of joy? That's a good question. I have to say that uh, this is so surprising to me. I am, I am a New Yorker through and through. I was born on the Upper East Side. I spent my, other than my four years in Providence, Rhode Island, when I went to Brown for college, I have always lived in New York, not just in New York, but actually on the Upper East Side, right? I've always lived there. And if you would ask me, I'd say I could never leave New York City. It's who I am. It's almost like I, I am New York City. Um, and during COVID, because we were all forced to do things that, you know, we didn't expect, kicking and screaming, I was in East Hampton thinking like, you know, this is for one week, maybe two weeks, like so many of us. Um, and then slowly slowly something took hold of me and I think I started to change and I started to walking outside and spending more time outside and listening to things and just slowing down in a way and it changed me completely and now I would say spending and now I switched from East Hampton to Palm Beach spending time in Palm Beach makes me so happy like before before COVID my husband said to me at one point we, we have a house in Palm Beach he's I think it was like the maybe it was 2020 but pre-COVID he said I think we should try to like spend our weekends in Palm Beach maybe we leave and go there Thursday nights and I was like are you smoking crack like I'm not spending my weekends in Palm Beach like I, I we have a life here in Europe. we're just gonna have like no social life like we're just gonna be in Palm Beach all the time cut to I've chosen to live here from like the entire winter I feel like the pinch me I, it makes it, every day I wake up here to this blue sky, to the fact that I can walk, to the fact that I can be sitting outside, and it makes me like extraordinarily happy. I feel like I've never been happier. That maybe my truth wasn't New York City, like all along. Like who knew? Um, so mm -hmm. I think is that that makes sense. That kind of has made me really happy. Definitely. I can dig that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. This was Thank so you. fun. I loved talking to Liz. I mean, there's just so much there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love how open she is. And as you know, I relate a lot to her positivity. Um, there's just something about the way she floats through her life. And I say float intentionally because even the challenges, she just makes it all work. There were actually so many times during the conversation where I was like, I feel like when Liz is speaking, Sam is speaking. Because you you have such positivity. I mean, in the hardest moments of my life, you're just like, it's going to get better because it has to get better and we're just gonna keep moving. <laughs> and you just but like <laughs> those kind of people, but like that kind of view on life is really important. I mean, she's been through a lot. And I think if you have to go through a lot of things in life, which we all do, right? We are all going to go through very hard things. It, to be able to look at it and say, this is happening, this isn't fair, this is terrible, but what I can do is control my, control my reaction and keep moving, like, that makes life a lot better. It, yeah, and, and, and by the way, all of the things you just mentioned, whether it's her health or her marriage falling apart, any of those things could level a person, right? And, she, you know, her, her company, her financial situation going bust. I mean, there were so many times she could have been leveled and she just kept getting back up. And it's, I, I really credit her mindset for so much of it. I really do. And I also think one thing, one big takeaway too, when she talked about meeting her husband, her current husband, 
and first date, like first meeting, there wasn't, you know, wasn't any chemistry, but always taking that second date. I think that lesson is important for friendships because we can build it. We can make new friends as adults. Sam and I made new friends as adults. Like we need to remember we can do that, but you might not hit it off the first time or people you're doing business with, like always kind of like sticking to it past that initial thing. I feel like in a culture of instant gratification, we forget that sometimes relationships, all relationships, take time and the first impression might not be the one that defines the years to come. That's an excellent point. By the way, Amy, I will say that Liz Lang is like my personal fashion icon. Okay. So when she told me to wear like, like solid shift dresses and heels, like I, I, and no pantyhose, like I literally, my entire closet is full of that. Right. And then the pandemic hit and I'm like, oh crap, nobody wears high heels anymore. And I don't need to be cold anymore when I'm speaking. So I'm going to wear like pantsuits and stuff like that. But then when she said that she normally wears monochrome sweatsuits and ballet flats, do you know what I did the next day? I gave myself permission to buy a monochrome <laughs> sweatsuit and ballet flats. And my daughters are like, oh my gosh, you're going to wear ballet flats now? How old are you? I'm like, no, it's going to look. I love it. And Ruby's like, please, mom, please, no. And I'm like, I love it. <laughs> I can see this entire conversation happening in your house. <laughs> anyway, that is amazing. Well, I think you know, Liz inspired me and... Um, I think she's someone to look up to. Thanks for listening to What's Her Story with Sam and Amy. We would appreciate it if you leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, connect with us on social media at What's Her Story Podcast. What's Her Story with Sam and Amy is powered by my company, The Riveter, at theriveter.co and Sam's company, Park Place Payments, at parkplacepayments.com. Thanks to our producer, Stacey Para, and our male perspective, Lou Burns.